So <clears throat> the three things that are happening in that video, one is Stuart Kaufman's The Adjacent yes. Possible. Mm -hmm. The second is Greg's uh, Tree of Knowledge. Yeah. And the, the third is uh, the, the inquiry. <laughs> it's funny. So Daniel Schmeckenberger and I have been going back and forth on the inquiry of what is the, the, the battery I'm going to have to explain what I mean by this, but what's the battery of civium? Right. right. And, and the way when I, I put that question to him, I said, look, one, one of the moments of genius of Elon Musk, one of the many, but one of the most, I think, central, is the, I'll call it, strategic grasp of Moore's law. Right. And so we, we, the, 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 the battery, which is to say energy density per dollar specifically, Right. The technological complex, which right now shows up as lithium ion batteries, um, has this characteristic in the context of the electric motor. So it's almost like these two relationships. You've got the electric motor, which is like a fundamental architecture. Then you've got the, the, the battery, which is the rate limiter on the potential of that fundamental architecture. Right. And you've got this series of, of, of step functions or trophic cascades. And what, what must grasp was that there's a, a way to order things such that uh, the larger milieu, in this case, capitalism, will orient activity to exploring the adjacent possible in battery space up to some limit. Mm -hmm. And if you, if, you, if you get to a particular location, which is the Tesla Roadster, you can combine the, the, the power density over dollar of, of battery space at that moment with the electric motor to produce a change, a feedback loop back into capitalism, which generates more resource allocation, like more money right. to fund R&D in exploring battery space, which because battery space is on this Moore's law, and that's kind of the point is on this Moore's law, gets you on a, some form of exponential growth, or in this case, exponential declining cost, depending on your preference. So let's say, for example, at $1,000 per kilowatt hour, the only thing that is marketable at all is the Tesla Roadster, this very, very narrow territory. Right, right. Once the Tesla Roadster hits, it generates enough resources to then move batteries along their Moore's law curve to the point where in call it 18 months, it doesn't matter, it, it halves, right? So $500 per kilowatt hour, but $500 per kilowatt hour now oh, generates- The number of machines, right. Right, but now, now you can do the Tesla Model S, which is a hundred times more market space. Like the volume of that market space is a hundred times larger than, than the roadster, maybe even a thousand times, maybe you know, six orders of magnitude, um, which then recursively generates another flow of resources that allows you to do the work necessary, the, what's it called in Kaufman's language, it's the, uh, the thermodynamic cycle, like the thermodynamic labor. It provides the resources necessary to do the thermodynamic labor to explore the adjacent possible in battery space to then move you to the next step function in Moore's law, which is then $250 per kilowatt hour, which then unlocks the model three, which is, you know, let's call it six orders of magnitude more uh, market marketability. And you get this series of feedback loops. Like it's actually like a, uh, so it's funny. The, 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 the actual electric engine, in this case, is actually a metaphor for a tap engine, the adjacent possible engine, right? Ah, okay. um, and then what Greg talks about is Greg actually talks about if you zoom out and you take a look at the, the kind of the macro story of what the Moore's Law space of the tap engine looks like, are you with me on this? Yep. You actually so see, you can actually start getting a giant, you know, in just the same way that Elon Musk could look at the, at the battery and the Moore's Law sort of capitalism thing, you can actually get a similar visibility to say, oh, okay, so we went from matter to life to behavior to culture, and each right. one is a, a series of moves in this, in this, in this tap Moore's mm -hmm. Law. Right. And, and we can now think about how do we actually design a tap engine that moves us along that particular Moore's Law and that's the, the generator function at the heart of Civium. Wow, that's very cool. Um, that's very cool. I like that.
So uh, you know that Greg and I have been in constant uh, uh, dialogue as well, right? Uh, we mentioned that, yes. Yeah, Very yeah. excited. Because uh, he's he and I have been doing two things. We've been integrating sort of theory of knowledge with relevance realization theory, uh, which he sees as the two are deeply interpenetrating. And um, that thing you just described, that arc, is of course, uh, um, it's a metaphysical extension of Evan Thompson's idea of deep continuity in cognition, um, all the way down and all the way up. Mm. You, and that, that's, the, that's the connection that Greg sees between theory of knowledge and relevance realization uh, and deep continuity. And then Greg and I are now actually doing a series together. We've actually filmed uh, a couple of episodes uh, where we are doing what's called Untangling the World Knot of uh, Consciousness, the Hard Problems of Mind and Meaning. And mm -hmm. so we're going through um, an extensive argument I've built about trying to get a naturalistic account of consciousness. And you see how that then plugs into his uh, 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 tree of knowledge model as well. Uh, so um, it might uh, be a good idea if the three of us actually spoke at some time. That uh, might I think that's, that's definitely the next step. And the next yeah. is definitely going to be to get the three of us. Um, and I'm wondering, it's not, I don't think it's just ready yet, but I, I definitely see somebody like Zach Stein as being in that next wave. And maybe, yep. maybe Chris, like there's something there. Yes. I mean, it does, yeah, you know, Zach and I just filmed another conversation with Andrew Sweeney. So Zach and I have also built up a uh, very powerful momentum. We've gotten into a discussion about the metapolitical, which I think is a very interesting uh, discussion that uh, um, Zach and I are having. And, so, and that strikes me as part of what the cultural side of the civium is also trying to address. Um, so I yeah. mentioned your work a couple of times. I meant to, oh, I meant to show, show, send you something, I'm sorry. Um, Akira the Dawn did a meaning wave around uh, steal the culture. Um, and then he and I had a discussion on the STOA about it. And I mentioned your work on the civium uh, in that discussion, so. I'll have to see that meaning wave. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a very interesting character in this, in this story. Yeah, very much. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a pleasure. And talking about that whole notion was really cool. Because I thought, the, uh, I, I presented the argument that, that I think there's deep consonance between the, the project of trying to steal the culture um, and the project of trying to uh, bring about something like the Civium. I think those two are deeply connected. Well, okay, so having, having, having not watched that dialogue, let me throw some things in there. So the first, I guess maybe I'm kind of uh, uh, lo loading my Akira the Dawn like simulator. So. <laughs> like a little bit more playful with the words. So uh, you know, steal the culture. And I was like, yeah, like steal the culture, like to, to, to make the culture stronger, to, to, to uh -huh. kneel the culture. Um, and, and so, the, so here's the visual image. This is the thing that's been keeps popping into my head. Whoa, probably should, I'll, I'll try the visual image. I did just got even more visual in my conversation with Greg. Um, it's like, okay, so we have the example of the, the discovery in complex chemistry space mm -hmm. of the very specific, mm, well, complex, the very specific architecture uh, that includes things like DNA, RNA, and cell membranes. Yeah. So there's some, yeah. some, some specific, very specific architecture that includes these as aspects of complex chemistry that are naturally occurring in complex chemistry space that when arranged in a very precise way generate a portal, which is to say generate a, an enormously asymmetric shift in the probability landscape, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which then creates the opening into the next, right? That's the whole talk thing, right? That. Look, so this is the Aristotelian idea that living things can do things and can actualize matter in a way that inorganic processes never can. I mean, yeah. Yeah, Greg so, agrees uh, with the idea that it's, uh, what's happening is ultimately a, re, a, a reinventio of, the, uh, of Aristotle's notions, um, which I think is right. Um, and so people in the philosophy of biology are talking about this in terms of uh, a, con a closure of constraints. Not only do you have constraints closing feedback cycles in life, you have constraints that form a systematic closure with respect to each other. They're all me so the constraints are not only downward, they're not only constraining the feedback cycles, the constraints are also locked together in becoming mutually interdependent with each other. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. When I said architecture, that what I was referring to is that notion of the the interlocking 
mesh of constraints that holds yeah. the constraint complex into a into something. Right. Things and that them. and that that's powerful language because when you move to the talking about that kind of architecture of constraints, you can see why it makes accessible the adjacent possible because constraints are exactly the shaping of possibility. Right. right? And so that that gives you sort of a more clearer explanation of why it moves, why you get that change and shift. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so cool. So take that, in particular, if anybody happens to be holding that like very clearly, and then apply that to culture space. Yes. So to, to, to what's, the, what's the term you guys are using? Recapture the culture? Oh, it re, uh, I, I yeah. talked about steal. Uh, steal the culture, yeah. Uh, the term I used a moment ago was uh, reinventio. I picked up on the Latin word inventio, uh, uh, from Carrie's book, because inventio means, uh, it, 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 it falls between two words that we put in opposition. It means both to discover and to make, inventio. Uh -huh. so, uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. yes, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so the, 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 if, you, if you sort of compare those two, what happens is, or a way of saying what, what you're saying in this, in this other language, is to discover and or invent, inventio, the set of downward and interoperating constraints that select from culture space that particular um, precise culture that is the moral equivalent of DNA, RNA, and cell membranes. Right. That that that's what I'm trying. That that I think that's the analogy I was using when I was talking to Akira, and that actually came from an earlier thing I said when I was on the Stoa answering the question. Um, the analogy I use is the way Christianity stole the culture, um, that it wasn't a, a political revolution um, to, attempting to overturn the regime. What it was, was a bottom-up creation of an alternative culture that eventually, right, that is largely ignored and then oppressed, but then eventually basically becomes the basis of a new civilization um, in the medieval period. And so that's what, that's what I mean about what I, what I'm, what I'm trying to facilitate with my work. Yeah, great, exactly. And so what you could say is, is there's something that is, uh, uh, I'm gonna use the term generator function probably not very well, but I'm trying to represent the, the selection or the, the set of, of constraints in the way that we were just describing it, which is, is meta to, actually transcendent to the actuals of, of the given culture. So yes, exactly, exactly. So Christianity op operates as a new transcendent, a new generator function in culture space that selected from the milieu that was available in Rome, uh, yeah. which of course is very large, rich, over rich, like it's an adjacent possible, it's actually uh, over, overwhelmingly uh, large, selects a particular subset of that into what then becomes a culture that has characteristics that are more adaptive in the context of the decline of Rome. Yes. And, and they make possible new ways of being. I mean, so Carrie's book, where I got the term inventio from, basically argues that Augustine crafts our notion of the interior self. Um, and of course you get Christian, the Christianity uh, promotion of ideas of agape uh, uh, and all kinds of new ways of being. Um, and, and, and these have huge cultural consequences and sociopolitical consequences. Uh, this is part of Tom Holland's argument, right? That, uh, you know, Christianity makes infanticide a moral crime, whereas, but previously, infanticide is an accepted practice. We are now so inculturated by this that, it, it, to use Frankfurt's term, it's not a live option for us. We can imagine it and infer it, what it would be like, but for none of us, could we, could we bring ourselves to get to that state of interior agency and external uh, uh, you know, participation where that would be a viable alternative for us? And mm -hmm. so that's, that's, uh, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm hearing when you're saying how it's possible to, to move to the adjacent possible. I'm, I, I'm connecting that to Frankfurt's notion of going from things that are abstract possibilities to viable options for people. That that's the actual cognitive move that's happening when we're talking about this. Yeah, okay, so what I'm seeing there is something like, um... I guess it looks a little bit like a rhizome, a little bit like a kind of a branching or capillary system, right? Okay. And there's a, a growing towards or a becoming more adjacent to, and then a critical energy. So I've got a, a person and I've got a, a location in culture space and I've got a distance that they're, that they're ready, willing and able to go. Right. 
And as, as the, the rhizome, as the capillary structure of, of culture branches until it gets within that critical distance, then they will migrate, right? They will make the move to get onto that particular branch. Right. But, uh, but I would make it a little bit more biological in that I would make it more like niche construction. That, right, their moving is also helping to draw Right, uh, right. It, it's like it's like the it's like the organism environment niche construction model. I think that's so. I see yeah. what people are doing. It, it, niche construction is the way in which that sort of evolves into existence. Right, and so this is like this is the, this, this itself. What we're describing here is sort of the meta constraint on okay. the generator function, right? And any viable generator function has to look like that. And then we apply the this is the, you know, the stuff that you and Greg. Are, are, are sort of the reason why you're the right people to be doing this is that we then apply the, the our best understanding of the actual context. You know, yes. What yes. are the actual designs of cultural milieu that are highly in alignment with the best ways for people to, you know, feel uh, seen and to activate their highest potential and all that other kinds of stuff, right? If you, if you can, yes. that, that's sort of a, you know, if, you, if you say like any, any culture where simultaneously any person will feel like they are more well met. They're, they're living, their well being is going, they feel like their well being is going up by participating in it. And it is so designed that their participation increases the global capacity of that culture to upgrade the well being of every member of that culture. And yeah. that's a, sort of mathematically, the, the hard part is doing it, but mathematically, that's what you're looking to do. And I, I, just, I just to be back just to oh. kind of find it. And the point or the proposition is, is that that language and the language of the portal pathway or the cell membrane, DNA, RNA, location, precise location and culture space, like those are the same. Yes. They're, they're, they're two different ways of talking about the same kind of thing. So, so I like all of that, I, I will, I, but I have a potential addendum or maybe I, you're saying this and I just haven't seen, seen it implied. I think what happens in these transitions is not only, an, and maybe you mean this by upgrade, it's not just a qualitative change. Uh, sorry, it's not just a quantitative, a quantitative change in well-being. It's not like the Christians felt like they had what the Roman elite had, but just more. Mm. They felt that the, the field of human existence and experience had been widened qualitatively, not just a quantitative expansion. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so let's hit this tone. I don't think I've actually done this yet out loud, so we'll just, this is great to have this here. So uh, Tyson uh, Junko Purta, the Sand Talk, I, I recommended his book recently. So yeah. I'm going to be referencing his stuff a lot, and, and I imagine that at some point not too long from now we'll also be getting into relationship but he makes a really good distinction from an indigenous knowing perspective but a very good distinction between growth and increase right he talks about it in the context of economics but for example if i want to get smarter i mean a broad brush i don't want to get into the details if i want to get smarter i've got basically two basic approaches i can either grow the no the size of my brain i can add more neurons i can just get a bigger brain mm -hmm. and that's a little bit like saying i'm going to, I'm going to grow gdp i'm just going to kind of add more piles of gold to the, to the pieces of gold to the pile of gold that I've got. Or I can, I can increase the quality of relationships of, of neurons. Right? I can increase the quality of synaptic con uh, connections. Yeah. And, and so he, you know, his point or his, his proposition is that broadly speaking, civilization or more narrowly capitalism has a growth model and right? it wants to just add more neurons yes whereas yes. the the indigenous approach and we'll just sort of propose the approach that you were just describing in the context of the the right answer to culture space is this increase approach yes and that's what was central in aristotle right uh, an animal is not just more of a plant an animal can do things it's animate it can move around and explore the environment in ways that are qualitatively different and then rational beings can explore conceptual space in a way that merely animated beings cannot, et cetera. That, right. so that's the qualitative thing that's very, very central. Right, right. So, let's, so, so let's, I want to make that, I want to I kind of double click on that. So two moves. I'm going to remember, I put my thumb up here as a mnemonic to remember, remember the second move. Okay, so the first move, and I'm going to return this back to the notion of Sibium, all the way back to the very first video in the Sibium series, sure. what is... If I take a look at Metcalfe's law, like the thing that thing that drives cities to become vast, Metcalfe's law is really just talking about the size of the adjacent possible. 
uh, the size of in possibility space, or the number of possible relationships, right? right. And I'm actually talking about growth. If I add another person, I grow the number of possible relationships. But there's this other thing over here, which I'm going to call Young Caperto's Law, which has to do with the how do you go about actually selecting from the possible the actual relationships, right? which is a qualitative question, not a quantitative question. How do I increase the quality of relationality inside the zone of possibility? You could think of it just like Facebook, right? There's a, an arbitrarily large number of possible right. relationships, but which ones do you actually have? And, and in that context, there seems to be three primary variables. One variable is, in some sense, the who, like do I talk with, do I know John? Do I know Greg? I, who? And there's eight-ish billion people out there. What tiny, tiny subset of that are the ones I'm going to have a relationship with at all? Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is, in some sense, the what. So now that I'm in relationship with John now, what's the orienting basis of what aspect of that large possibility space of just our relationship that we're focusing on? And then, in some sense, there's the how, which is to say, what is our capacity as individuals in all the ways, like our capacity to communicate, our capacity to emotional regulate, you know, our capacity to collaborate, all that skillfulness of being in relationship that you know, grabs as much of the sphere of possibility in the relationship as we can. Right? So if I, if I think about all three of those characteristics, if I can consistently work toward generating a, a network, right, a community, a set of relationships that has as its, back to the kind of Moore's Law battery feedback loop, as its, as its surplus value as a generative result, every move in the network, by increasing the quality, it increases those three characteristics. So each sort of day, the converse, the relationships I'm entering into are, are, are a better, a higher quality set of relationships. The, 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 the scope, the thing that is happening in the context of those relationships is the most, what is called for in that moment. And the people in relationship are, are getting better and better and better at actually being in relationship, right? And so that, that creates a series of feedback loops that has this, this movement. That's, that's qualitative, that's focus on the qualitative level one. Okay. Focus on qualitative level two is this thing where we say, okay, like the Aristotelian piece, which is say, okay, once you've done that, once you've been able to make this move, where you're actually sort of designing culture around those three uh, variables, and finding a way to hold the network so that it is always upgradienting across that, 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 that direction, mm -hmm. you've now done the transition where you've moved, basically that's the last move in culture space, in, in the same sense that organic you know, genetics was the last move in complex chemistry space, um, and, and that culture was the last move in behavior space, where I'm referring to talk. So that's the last move in culture space which unlocks this whole new territory about which we can only say a little bit, right? We can say some things, we can't actually say a lot about what the affordances that are perhaps even novel. Right? There's mm -hmm. something that happens in this post-cultural domain. And I don't mean post in the sense that culture is left behind, I mean post in the sense that it's actually what happens when you kind of get culture dialed in so that you can, you can actually radically change the probability of, of what sits, what, you can so radically change the probability landscape of what is generated by culture, you can actually now begin to build on top of it a whole new layer of stuff. Again, in the same way that culture sits on top of a narrow band of mind and mind sits on top of a narrow band of life and life sits on top of a narrow band of chemistry. Um, so that's like mode one is focusing on optimizing for the qualitative characteristics of this Metcalfe's law dynamic. Mode two is once you've got that dialed in, you can basically figure out what's the, uh, what was the way you described it, the set of constraints mm -hmm. that uh, hold that thing together. So each iteration is, oh, is an upgradient on the previous iteration. Then you've got a, a pop into this next portal pathway. So that sounds very much like, um, and I mean this as a compliment, that sounds very much like a cultural or, or a distributed cognition analog uh, to the kind of uh, metaphysics that Aristotle's building um, in his account. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering then if that analog holds, a, a question emerges, uh, it strikes me that there was a fourth. You did the, the who, what, and how, but Aristotle also has a why, um, mm. which is there's an emergent uh, phenomenology of normativity that, right, the, 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 uh, that's what I meant about a qualitative change in well-being. What it is for a plant to be good is deeply unsatisfying to me 
or to, for an animal to be good. And what it is for an animal to be good or to have a good life is deeply unsatisfying to me as a rational agent. Yes. And, right? And so what happens, so you, you start to move up from survival to power to truth, right? And, and, right? and so you get the one, one marker of an emergent space of viable adjacent possibility is an emergent lived new normativity. And I don't mean a new moral rule, I mean a new moral principle, but our new normative principle, perhaps morals too, I don't mean just moral, I mean epistemic and aesthetic, right? And perhaps beyond. But mm -hmm. some sort of, so a new normativity is emerging. And again, it's not merge, emerging, it's not, I'm not talking about a new set of rules, I'm talking about the, the way in which we judge the value of things. It is, it, it, the point here, the reason why it's challenged is, is we probably can't say much about it. Right? And maybe saying isn't even, even going to be the right tool. You know, saying is kind of a cultural tool. Um, but if you, the, but the metaphor works, right? If I say, okay, I've got, a, I've got a kind of a why space, a sense and value domain that is appropriate to the level of plants. And you know, what it means to live a good life at the level of plants is deeply unsatisfying to, to you. Right. Um, and plants have no real ability to relate to the set of values and sense that you have. That's right? right. And the proposition is that if we dial this thing in at the level of culture, we enter into a new milieu about which we can say only that it stands in relationship to culture in the way the culture or humans stand in relationship to plants. And you can say that it will vastly and the word vast is, isn't even a big enough word. We need some, I'm going to have to tap into your vocabulary. Super double plus vastly uh, <laughs> increases Y space, increases the, the, the domain of sense and value at, at a level that would leave, you know, 20th century humans, certainly, but you know, us kind of going like, you kind of shrug. It's just like this. It's a, it's a, we, we can't use ordinary cognition or language to refer to it in just the same way that a plant can't use ordinary planting to refer to, to you know, the well-being of a, of a human. Okay, so, so let's use a historical analog for that, because I've used this argument in, in, in Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. We, can, we do not, and I don't mean propositionally, I mean at this level of phenomenological normativity, we cannot identify with the pre-axial world. Right, we, we it's not a lot. It's not a livable option for us. I can learn all kinds of propositions and make inferences and come up with excellent theories about the Egyptians and the world, but they're not. They're not. I don't identify with them. I'm not. I'm not. It's not capable. And that's to me analogous to what you're talking about. There is a cultural organization in the Bronze Age, um, and, and it moves in a continuous cosmos, a very different normativity space than one we have now. And then what that speaks to me, if that, so I'm building an analogy on an analogy. So this is getting precarious epistemically. I acknowledge that right here, right now, but we're friends and we're playing with ideas, right? What I, what I look for is, and, and of course what's happening, right, is you get a fundamental sociocultural uh, organi reorganization, right? Um, and the place I see where people play with the emerging normativity and, and inventio it, they're both discovering it and inventing it in, in connection to how this is coming about is of course, you know, the, the emergence of a, a fundamentally do, new religions. Um, that, and and that, was a, a, that, was, that was, you know, you get the emergence of all the, and notice what the actual age religions do. They, they, right, they create these universal religions that have put us in a much different normativity space than we ever were in the pre-axial world. And so what I've taken that as an argument to me to be about and in connection with stealing the culture is to try and look at sort of the meta processes that help might facilitate um, the birth of, you know, a new religion spoken grandiosely. Hence the religion that's the project of the religion that's not a religion. And most importantly, the whole project of dialectic and dialogos as the place is trying to create a virtual engine in which that machinery of playing with emergent phenomenal, an emergent phenomenology of normativity is actually taking place. Um, and you, you were on my Discord server. There are communities out there that are playing with this mm -hmm. right now. They're playing with this right now. Yeah, and just to, I mean, it seems like a, a, an opportunity right now to do a little bit of clarification because I know that the, the languaging of religion, the languaging that religion is not a religion is oftentimes Confusing, 
Yes. Uh, and I mean, it's so kind of hyper confusing because we live at the tail end of a war where science declared rhetorical war on, on religion because it had to. Um, and, and it's kind of smeared and confused the name. So what I believe we mean by the reference to the term religion is a little, it, it is very much like this, this, this uh, metaphor of, of DNA, RNA, and cell membrane. But that's my point. What religion means is going to go through that kind of shift. Like it's going to be qualitatively different. Right. That's qualitatively what I mean. different. Exactly. Right. Like if you compare religion after the actual revolution to religion before, that's what I'm talking about. It's not like new proposition. It's the mean, the very meaning of what it was and what wisdom is and what meaning, it, like all, and the, what the transcended, all of that had undergone a fundamental change. That's what I'm talking about. Right, exactly. So when we talk about what, what this, sort of, uh, this next thing looks like, we have to become super abstract to be able to say, okay, is there a continuity? Is there, is there a continuity? There's transformation, but there's change. Is there any sense of continuity that allows us to use the same word to refer to them at all? Or should we be using a different word? And I believe there is actually continuity, but it has to do with something like some interlocking, intermeshed set of constraints. I think so. I mean, uh, I mean, so Evans' take on an update of Aristotle is called the deep continuity hypothesis, and it's the idea that there, um, you know, that there's there's. Well, first, I'll say how I think he takes it, and then my interpretation of it. And I don't want those confused because he might not agree with the second thing. Mm -hmm. So the, the point about deep continuity from Aristotle is, you know, um, it's not like it's not a ladder. The, the, the animal doesn't leave all of the principles and patterns of the, of the plant behind. Right. But it, it builds on them. And this is yep. your DNA metaphor. It scaffolds on them. Right. New machinery that allows new things. And so how Evan sort of tends to present it is, you know, there is both identity and difference when we talk about deep continuity and both are important. The way I've tried to understand that is with the evolutionary metaphor of exaptation. Because in exaptation, it's, it's not like I've, so my tongue, there's continuity between the tongue that masticates and tastes and the tongue that speaks. But that doesn't mean that taste and speech are uh -huh. identical. And so that, that, and so I think my hope, my theoretical hope is that, and this is I think what Greg and I are, 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 are groping towards, is that the machinery of things like relevance, realization, and religio is the thing that's going to go through some kind of exaptation in this. Yeah, yeah exactly. So perfect. So it's almost like a, mm, I don't want to say two sides of a coin or two sides of a mirror, but there's, there's two, there's like a uh, two sides. So the tongue, the tongue that speaks must also be the tongue that tastes. Right? Yes. Yes. You dispense with the prior. You, you must maintain. So you think like animals, so animals and plants are, right, so there's a, there needs to be some way of bringing in, resources from the outside. There needs to be some way of, of, of copying and, and high fidelity replication of the construct. But there's a whole set of things that are the same between plants and animals. Yes. What animals do is animals uh, do two things, right? One is they satisfy the requirements uh, that, are the, 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 that are the shared requirements of plants and animals in a way, right, that then unlocks a whole new, whole new milieu, a whole new possibility space, which is to say this, they exact. They, they, this, yeah. You can say that, it's funny, animal is actually a particular solution to organism. Yes. Right? Yeah. And it's a particular solution to organism, which by the way is, is, is radically dependent on plant yep. um, as part of its input, as part of its complex, and by virtue of solving or, the organism problem in a particular way, unlocks this exaptive potential, which is the new milieu. Yeah. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. That's so, exactly what I wanted to convey. So this thing, the, the tr, that's not tr, 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 it feels very Hebrew. We, we don't have the vowels in between them. Um, uh, it has the same thing, right? On the one hand, sort of downward facing or inward facing or past facing, it's a, it's a solution to culture space, a solution to religion space. Yeah. Um, that, that is, sits alongside all the other solutions to culture and religion space in a particular way, but it does so in a fashion, and probably, by the way, in a fashion which is dependent upon many oh, other, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But it unlocks a new exaptive potential. And, and that right. new exaptive potential has a whole set of qualities or affordances, uh, like from, you know, a dog eats, but a dog does not, 
does not sing. It, 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 it yeah. can vocalize, but it does not sing. Um, same thing, right? The curve trap, you know, solve the problem of religion space, but it opens up this new, this new milieu. And this new milieu is one in which we currently can't, we can't even, oh, we can just kind of point at it because yeah. by definition, until it happens, it ain't happened and we can't know what's going to be in there. Right. I, 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 that was beautifully said. What I'm adding to that, and I think you're, you are too in practice, is I feel a moral imperative uh, to try and figure out, and this is pragmatic, uh, like it's, it, uh, we're, we're facing a, a transformative experience in the LA Paul sense. We don't know what it's going to be like until we're on the other side. I get huh. that argument and I yeah, really yeah. agree with it. But, you know, but as I've argued, serious play is the best thing we have in the face of uh, mm. that kind of transition. Mm. And my moral imperative is how can I best facilitate the conditions of that serious play that have the most current fallible plausibility that I will help to uh, afford that acceptation that we're talking about. That's, that's sort of the project I'm really wrestling with right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's neat. Um, yeah, and the, the word serious play, you can, I found myself called to the play side. Yeah. You yeah. say, okay, you know, hey guys, check this out. Like all the cool things you ever heard of or ever thought of or ever dreamed of, every super cool thing that's ever been attractive in the entire history of all culture, um, that is, below the curve of what's on the other side of this thing. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah that's, very, <laughs> very, that's very intoxicating. So how do you do, so if you if you like the, my, my uh, thing about sort of the, uh, the moral, the, 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 like the, you know, the, that sense of being called, let's put it that way, that sense of being called to try and facilitate that, uh, that, um, so, what, 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 does that, what, do, what does that mean though, uh, sort of practically, do you think? Um, hmm. I say that again. Okay, so we're, we, like, so I, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, so I'll just speak from my, my, my perspective. I see myself as, right, and, and, and when I use the word pragmatic, I use it like in the, you know, in the Jamesian, you know, I, I'm using it in a, in a yeah. strict epistemological sense, right? Uh, so, um, I want to do my sort of pragmatic best to facilitate, figure out the conditions of serious play that are most likely to afford people uh, to exact without falling into the usual trope of a utopia. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, what, what came for me as you were saying that is something like. What does it feel like to be called to singing when the tongue has yet only known taste? Right, right. right? It's right. like that labial experimentation of uh, the discovery of a, like we're right next to singing this, right? We're almost like, you know, there's like this kind of experimental, like lurching into and like this cracking and croaking, like this coordination between the voice box and the lungs and the lips and the tongue. It's funny, oh, it's actually. You know, you yeah. watch a child learning how to whistle. Yeah, yeah. It's like that, right? There's a, ah, there's something there, man. I can fucking feel it. It's almost there. But all I can do is like sometimes pucker my mouth and blow, but it's not quite coming through. Yeah. That's, that's the place, right? So the, it, it's important to recognize that's the place. You know, check this shit out. How to, a good metaphor. Utopianism is when a kid does this. Think like three-year-old. See what I just right. did there? I faked it. <laughs> I didn't actually whistle. I puckered my lips like I was whistling and then I hung. I could do those two things together. That's utopianism. Right? Utopianism is what happens when you fake it. When you try to simulate the reality that we can kind of sense, it's right over there. If we just kind of get the, all the right pieces together in the right way to generate the possibility that we can sense. Like we can sense that possibility in some, like, oh man, it's just almost there. Um, and utopianism is, is faking it. So, okay, so one, don't fake it. Yeah, don't don't pretend that you're doing something you're not doing. Mm -hmm. uh, good, and, good, that's or, useful. Yeah, and rec recognize that there's, you know, it's it's a it's practice. There's a, there's a there's a practice, and that practice is this really interesting practice that happens in a certain mode, or it ha happens in this mode of of, of serious play. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, one of the things I actually did during the sort of the the, the most quarantined period of this of this last few months was pick what are life skills that I have always 
been interested in getting that I've never spent the time getting because I got time. What am I going to do? So I focused on this whistle, like the two fingers in the mouth. Yeah. Um, still not there, but I can kind of do it. And so I actually <laughs> had that exact experience of like, ah, oh, okay, hold on, like this and that. And that kind of, exp you have to be in a very experimental mode. You have to try different things and play yeah, back yeah. and forth. And, and, and yet here's the trick. And this is the thing that I think is, um, I don't know, like hammer on, on steel. The orienting basis of the subtle awareness of the directionality towards getting it right. Yes. Well, this goes towards the faith stuff we've been talking about, I think. Yes, yes. So let's just unify. It's, it's, the, it's the, the thing that is searching inside the space of, of the adjacent possible. If I, if I think about just this problem, how do I whistle? And if, if all I did is try to do a combinatorial across all the different configurations available there, no fucking way, right? It's a yeah, yeah. nearly infinite problem. Yeah. There's some way to, to have access to a set of constraints that radically, radically constrain, like one times 10 to the 120th constrain the configurations in the possibility space such that it actually is something that I can then begin to operate within. And so there's something there, right? There's some, like you said, there's some mode, something that we have yes. that, yeah. that we can use to, to notice or, 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 or do something around that constraint characteristic. And then something that we have to be able to explore within the boundaries of that constraint characteristic um okay vague too vague hmm okay well there's let me go back you i mean you hit the nail you hit this nail probably more resoundingly than anybody I've ever met which is well that something is definitely not propositional yes yes that, that something is something that has to by definition take into account and take advantage of the whole lineage of the universe from the beginning until the moment you were you know, right now. Right? <laughs> it doesn't leverage all of it and the best of it, it's definitely not gonna get the job done. Yeah. Um, so let's not take a narrow slice through like a, a particular subset of that whole that was super interesting in the 1950s and just do that. Like let's actually really think about how do we grasp the whole of reality as much as we can and bring it to bear in this particular problem domain. Yes, I agree with that totally. Ha. Yeah, this is where Greg's stuff gets extremely mystical very quickly. What's he called? Like the sun elephant or something like that? Yeah. Like... But it's not a bad metaphor, right? I mean, in some sense, what we were just talking about is that each of us then is a particular, right? we're a singular aspect of that whole and in continuity with that whole. Right? So there's a, a way in which this story of the, uh, the, the coordination or the coherence of this network, this group of, 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 of singular beings, people, is the whole, which is to say the whole of reality, or at least a quantum of the whole of reality that, that particular uh, distributed cognition contains, doing its thing, right? Be becoming operant on itself. I think that's right. I mean, and that's, that, that in a sense, completes Aristotle's model because what you get at the highest level for in his model of human beings, I mean the gods are above it, but they're not in they're not in the they're not in the analysis, is at every previous level you have machinery of actualization, right? So the plant actualizes a particular potential in organic manner that couldn't be actualized before, right? And then the animal actualizes a potential in vet in in vegetative existence that couldn't be actualized before and then you get the right and then you get what you might call the cognitive agent that actualizes but then at the top of it is the rational agent and what the rational agent does is um, they appropriate actual that actualization as a kind of self-actualization the actualization process it becomes recursively self-actualizing in the rational being because right. the, the rational being is aware of all of the other and can bring that and can bring that into its processing in a way that a plant can't, an animal can't, or a merely cognitive being uh, can't. Exactly, and this is with that, that bend in the curve, right? That's, that's the, the deepest sense of that notion of the singularity that folks have hit on. You know, yeah. Because once you have the capacity to utilize actualization to increase the capacity to actualize. Yes, well once, said. You know, N is one, is, you know, the, the, the exponent is anything superlinear. Yeah anything super linear, then it goes like that. Mm -hmm. yes, um, exactly. Another way of saying the same, the same thing, but important. 
uh, geez. So, so, oh wait, wait. So, so this is a, this is crucial. So this is a it just landed. I just want to make let, remember the, the the animal does not dispense with the plant. Right? The plant does not dispense with chemistry. That's right. Culture right. does not dispense with social animals. Right? That's right. This threshold that we're talking about. It does not dispense with culture. It does not dispense with humans. It does not dispense That's with animals. It does not dispense with yeah. plants, right? It actually, the whole point is that it maintains the continuity and integrity of that entire substrate, right? That's right. That's right. And that's why it's better to think of it along the metaphor of exaptation rather than the metaphor of revolution. Yes. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And that's, so, so to, to land, we have this really beautiful story. Um, that has a characteristic of like, when we arrive, we arrive both at a location that we will acknowledge, we will feel is fully harmonious with our highest senses. It will seem, it will feel and appear to be of both the highest value and the most highest truth of which we can be aware, right? It will, it'll be awesome, right? It, it awesome, it'll be awesome in the, in sort of the banal sense, and then also, right, simultaneously, it will be awesome in, in, the, in the deeper sense. Right? It will open us up into a whole new gig about, you know, again, about which we can say very little right now. Um, and if, but, but we can say that, that the awesome in the deeper sense will always be self-consciously aware, crucially self-consciously aware of the necessity of its maintaining the integrity of the awesome in the more banal sense in perpetuity, or at least for a very long time. That's very good. When you said, when you were saying that, what came to mind is Paul and from, from Corinthians at the end of the hymn to Agape. For now we see as in a mirror darkly, but then we shall know even we shall know fully even as we are fully known. He saw Christianity as exactly the serious play of Agape, and right now we only see in a mirror darkly, but it will bring us somehow to the place where we will see fully, even as we are fully known. Mm -hmm. which, so that vision was actually part of his way of understanding um, the cultural acceptation that he was actually dedicated his life to trying to bring about. Mm -hmm. it's, yes. it's funny, in, in this weird circle in my own autobiography, I'm feeling more and more affinity with St. Paul, who was always a deeply ambivalent figure for me, uh, given my own particular religious upbringing. But I now appreciate more what he was trying to articulate. In fact, that was perhaps the best thing to have said. At the, you get the wonderful hymn from Agape, which is the new way of being. But he doesn't claim, and now we're in utopia. In fact, he says, but now we see in a mirror darkly. Notice it's a reflection and it's shadowed. But that, that act of constantly loving in that way and looking in that mirror, that reflection will actually bring us to the place we, where we fully know even as we are fully known, which is a very transjective way of putting this kind of thing I think you're talking about. It's, just, it's a similar kind of vision. And I just, I just thought that was a beautiful- I mean, It very well may be the same vision as far as I can tell. Yeah, maybe. Um, like, like we talked about the notion of the transcendent operator. We talked about the notion of continuity. Um, at least it seems plausible that there is a, there's a sort of a, a deep continuity I think I just copied the title um, with a transcendent operator, capital T. Yes, very much. In, in which case it is the same vision. Yeah, I, I think this goes towards the, 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 the work Chris and Andrew and I have been doing, which is sort of the reinvent of the notion of soul as that which dynamically mediates between moreness and suchness continuously. Um, and so, yeah, where the suchness is, you know, the, 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 the the non-categorical determinateness of your being, which of course is a product of all of your historicity and of all of the stacks from the participant, from the inorganic all the way up through the participatory, all the way up. But then the moreness is exactly what you're talking about, that relationship to right the indefinite possibility that is nevertheless not homogeneously indefinite. It has some you know nascent structure that we by serious play we are affording its emerging intelligibility to us. That's what I'm trying to do with the, 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 the seeing in the mirror darkly kind of idea. Yeah, so maybe just the last thing to put on this, because I'm noticing my, um, I'm definitely running out of energy. 
I mean, oh, oh, yeah. Talked about that, but this has been great. I'm so glad to be able to get back into into the flow with you, and I look forward to you, me, and Greg having a conversation. Yes, soon. Um, I'm definitely getting. I can. I notice that that my health is, you know, up and to the right. Like it cycles, but it's up and to the right. So it's it, it's. Back yeah, let's draw this to a close. I'll, I'll give you the last word, uh, but uh, I also wanted to say I'm also really enjoying this again with you. Yeah, so the, the thing that was coming into my mind, like I was having this sort of movie playing in the back of my mind as you were talking. Um, I don't know if you've, if, you've, if, if you've seen the video that I did about Oceanics, but the, the, no, I don't think the it's, it. it's the most recent Sibian video, and you can just look okay. it up. O Oceanics is a thing, but it's a, it's a vision. Uh, a very practical, this is the key, the point is practical. Uh, it's a vision of a way of living, like literally hexagons floating in the ocean, coordinated in particular ways. But you know, at the engineering level, having thought through a whole bunch of stuff, so the ability to do like closed loop water, or closed loop food, closed loop energy production, like a migration over a period of generations, and I don't mean human generations, I mean innovative generations where they can actually begin to produce themselves without you know imports of, of foreign materials and reducing externalities like it's a very practical imagination of a way of living that is well in some sense would feel pretty fucking utopian like a whole lot better so let's just put it a whole lot better by no means even intending to believe itself as being the end point but a a step function, like a whole step. If you think about like 19th, the 19th century way of living that we happen to have inherited, you know, the, the sort of weird ramshackle glue elevators to cars and boom, um, and, and try not to die too quickly. Um, it's like a whole bunch better than that, right? And it's like right now, like we're those guys i've been talking to them quite extensively they have the architectural design they get the system design they have the mechanical design they're in conversations around the legal regulatory like brass tax stuff yeah. about getting the capacity to build it now right? that's very okay. cool so practicality of that at the level of you might call ontological design like architecture yeah. physicality i feel like we're a little bit behind the curve at the level of the cultural side but not radically um yeah. I'm trying to ramp it up with the whole Dialogos dialectic project. Um, and, I'm really, I'm, I'm, and and I, I think it's it's one of these things where it's a matter of, of a combination. It's, it's mostly around finding the people who've actually been holding the other pieces, and then beginning to like you've got the, you've got the core code, right? The core code of how do we actually converse, how do we connect, yeah. how do we actually begin to frame it, bring in the people, and putting them yeah. in place, and then that should be an expanding sphere, right? It should be a network effect. Yeah, yeah. They're really good at getting the actuality out of it, not just the potential. So, so those are like, we've got this practicality. We're on the threshold of actually being able to begin the process of doing this thing. I should mention, by the way, that, that there is also some really good work being done at the level of socio-technology. Like, what are the agreements and how do we fund things in this weird transitionary period where money yeah. is still a, a, key, a key gating item? Um, but here's the flip side, right? The flip side is um, the urgency or the necessity of it yeah. is also quite present and, we're, and we're, growing and growing and let me just kind of like put a little bit of a well let's, let's do two so when paul was writing certainly the fall of rome probably had a very felt sense like like yeah the old way definitely ain't sticking together like that there was a viscerality to it but they lacked the practicality and right? the ability to actually get to the next place was yeah. not there right? you're not going to get to the moon in, in 800 ad um so, but we now have both we have the felt sense of the urgency, right? The thing we've been standing on is sinking rapidly and on fire and there's sharks and people are pulling it apart and fill in the blank. And, yeah. and, and by the way, as you look around, there's not like a Western Europe and, a, and, a, and an Anatolia next to us, right? It's every, everywhere you look, the whole thing's on fire. Right? Yeah. There ain't no place to go, but yeah. us, right? So the, the, the urgency, the fire, the, the you know, we didn't, how's that? We may not have intentionally, consciously chosen to set the ships on fire, but the ships are on fire. And this notion of practicality, that the, 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 the ability to reach up and grab that handhold and begin to pull ourselves up is proximal. It's, it's there, right? It's doable. Yes. Yes. So, so both of those, like we are now, as far as I know, in a unique location, I'm, I'm like quite confident, in a unique location in the sum total of, of all history uh, to have these characteristics. And, I don't want to say this in a super, super like banal way, but I found that it's been useful, particularly in talking with boomers. Um, superficially, 
this moment at the level of culture and politics resembles that period in the late 60s with which boomers were sort of indelibly marked. Right. Other underground and Chicago riots and crap like that. But even a little bit of fingernail scraping reveals the utter superficiality of it. Yeah, yeah. For example, in 1967, 1969, almost the whole of Western culture, certainly the whole of American culture, was solid. Yeah. It's this gigantic ups upwelling of potential that still hadn't even begun to slow down in terms of its capacity to continue being what it was, like this huge inertial move. And so while there was a, a breakdown going on, and that breakdown was significant and felt, the level of race relationships, the level of gender relationships, the level of culture and politics, it was like a little surface. It's like a, you know, a, yep. Yep. a rocket ship entering in, in, into the atmosphere where there's a fire here, but the rest of the rocket ship is in integrity. This ain't then, right? Now oh. the whole thing is on fire all the way through. You know, pick any institution. There is no institution that has a felt sense or a reality of strength, of competence, of integrity, of resilience, of, of duration. Right? They all kind of feel like they're doomed soon. <clears throat> so, so on the one hand, like things have not yet gotten as hot as they were at the peak of the 60s, but we're now standing on stilts, not on a pillar. And yeah. so as they tip over, the consequences are vastly more impactful than they were back then. So don't draw that metaphor um, or, or do draw the metaphor and then recognize that it's orders and orders and orders of magnitude worse than the metaphor would lead you to believe. I agree with that. All right. Sorry. I just felt like that was maybe a useful way of just sort of connecting a few little tiny dots. Yeah, the that's, that's why the metaphors I use are the, you know, the Bronze Age collapse, the end of the Western Roman Empire. Um, uh, those are the ones that I, I, I'm using. I, and I even say, uh, this is even more radical than what you're saying. I think that comparatively, the French Revolution is only scratching the surface of the change in culture compared to the kind of change we're facing right now. Right now. Yes. Yeah, right now. Yes. Exactly. So we are simultaneously proximal to stuff that we can name. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like the 60s. It's like the French Revolution. It's like the fall of Rome. Yep, those are things that we can name. And some of us may actually have a felt sense of what that means, um, which is to say right now, like it's clearly proximal <clears throat> and a whole lot bigger. Yep. You, yeah, I guess that's that. We've got, we've got a lot. All right, man. Yeah, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to drain you. Um, uh, just again, uh, this has been really good. And I think we should, uh, uh, towards what you said earlier about, you know, getting the convers I think getting the conversations going, I think the three of us, you, you and Greg and I need to have a conversation or at least a few of it around all of this because I think uh, there's very, uh, there's adjacent possibilities that we could very quickly actualize in the discussion, I think. Exactly. I'm in. Okay. Well, I'll be seeing uh, Greg tomorrow. I'll talk to him about it tomorrow. Okay, great. Yeah, let me know. Okay, take good care, my friend. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.